Thank you very much for having me come today to have a chat to you about my research. Um, on your seats you'll actually see there's actually a flyer about our centre, so if you want to know anything more about us there's a uh, little brochure you can take away. And um, as Professor Greeley mentioned, I've actually brought along some of my colleagues, so they'll be around to have a chat to you afterwards as well. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Centre for Emotional Health, but um, Professor Greeley has introduced us already quite well, so just a few extra things I want to mention to you. We actually have about 11 academic staff as part of the Centre, uh, six postdoctoral research fellows, of which I am one, and we have about 65 current students undergoing postdoctoral research themselves. Um, we're actually quite successful in a research capacity, so we actually have about $8.5 million worth of funding in the last four years. Um, but of course, the funding only uh, allows us to conduct research. It doesn't actually allow us to treat children outside of these research trials. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, and in the last ooh, year, it looks like 115 scientific publications in international journals and Australian journals. The Emotional Health Clinic is actually the uh, face, I guess, of the, the research that we do. And some of you may have known us by our previous name, which was the Macquarie University Anxiety Research Unit. There we actually treat children, adults and older adults who might suffer from anxiety or related problems. When we're running research trials, a lot of these people are actually treated as part of a research program in which they receive high quality treatment at very low cost. But once, when we're not running a research program, then individuals actually still come to our clinic and will pay privately to see our clinicians and receive the high quality uh, treatment that we offer. Unfortunately, we can't actually treat all the people that like to come to our clinic and my understanding is we have about 100 people or 100 children on our wait list currently who are just waiting, probably about a six month wait before they can actually receive treatment. So clearly there's a large demand for treatment of um, anxiety in our local area. We do treat about 500 clients a year through the clinic so we certainly try and get through a lot um, and we certainly have a very strong reputation um, in the public but also professionally and in fact internationally too. We often have a number of international guests and visitors who come to visit us to understand about our research but also to see how our clinic operates. I'm not going to talk much more about the clinic at this point but as I said I've got my colleagues here who will be very happy to answer any questions you might have about the centre or about the clinic later on. All right, these are some of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the prevalence of anxiety and depression in older adults. I would like to talk to you about how anxiety and depression present. So what are the common signs and symptoms in this age group? I also want to talk to you about the consequences of when we don't treat anxiety and depression in older populations. And then finally, I want to talk to you about some of the, the latest research from uh, myself and my students regarding some of these particular issues. So to start, I'm just going to provide you with a bit of background information about anxiety and depression in older adults so you can understand then how my research fits in. Now we all know the world's population is ageing, right? So this is just some brief statistics to demonstrate. The Australian Bureau of Statistics estimates that in terms of the number of people, number of people over the age of 65, in 2004 it was about 13% of the population. So that was 2.6 million Australians. By 2051, that will increase to 26% of the population. So over a quarter of the Australian population will be over the age of 65. So we know that not only are these, is the Australian population ageing, but we also know that longevity is increasing. So this next set of statistics talks about how people are going to continue to live for longer. In 2007, there was 1.6% of the population were over the age of 85. But by 2051, it will be more in the range of 5 to 7% of the population. So clearly, we need to make sure we pay a lot more attention to the needs of older adults, and particularly older, older adults who might be over 80 or over 90 or even over 100. Unfortunately, the research is lagging in this area. So we know that um, certainly understanding of psych psychological treatments or understanding of psychological disorders in older adults is an area that's quite neglected. Dementia t tends to get all the interest at the moment, um, but dementia actually only affects a small proportion of the population. So under about the age of 74, uh, the rates of dementia are only around 5%. <laughs> 
So clearly there's some other research that needs to be done in other issues that affect older adults. There's in fact very little research that is done in terms of understanding anxiety and depression in older adults. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what we know in this area now. And in fact, when we look at anxiety and depression, most of the research actually falls in terms of depression and there is actually very few studies at all done on anxiety in older adults. Just talk to you a little bit about the prevalence of anxiety and depression because this is actually one of the things that got me really interested in, in this area in the first place. So in terms of um, prevalence for anxiety disorders, we know that up to 10% of the older adult population will suffer from an anxiety disorder while around 24% will suffer from depression. But interestingly, these rates are lower than what we would see in younger adults. I'll just show you this, this particular graph, which hopefully will demonstrate this. I'm not sure if I've got a pointer, so I'll see what I can do to describe this here. But we have the uh, proportion of uh, individuals meeting criteria for disorder and then across the bottom you can see we've actually got the age groups. So the last category there is the 75 to 85 year olds and just before that is the 65 to 74 year olds. And the first category here is the 16 to 24 year olds. Now this data comes from the uh, National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing which was conducted in 2007. Now this is a general survey conducted around 8,800 households across Australia in which people are asked questions about their mental health status. The questionnaire is from people from 16 to age 85 and this is the prevalence data that's come from that survey and what we can see is that the anxiety disorders which are, sorry, the substance use disorders are the, 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 uh, the very light grey you might see the, on the left, this first column that's here and then the second column is a dark a dark colour, which is for your depression disorders, and then the last one is actually for the substance use disorders. But what you can see is that as people get older, as the population gets older, we see fewer and fewer rates of these particular disorders. So in fact, what this survey says is that as you get older, you're less likely to experience an anxiety or a depression disorder or even a substance abuse disorder. Good news, right? <laughs> Do you, are, you, are you disagreeing with our research? <laughs> and, and that is that people with uh, depression or uh, anxiety actually die earlier. Oh, <laughs> pessimist in the group. <laughs> this is a very interesting finding. Now, this is not just Australian research. This is replicated all around the world. All of the world surveys that are done show this exact same pattern of results. So people started jumping up and down. Some people said, well, this isn't right. Clearly, the way you're measuring anxiety and depression is wrong. And other people said, yeah, all the people with anxiety and depression have died. <laughs> and other people said, no, all the people with anxiety and depression are stuck in nursing homes and you didn't include them in the survey. And other people said, oh, people with anxiety, uh, older people don't want to admit they've got a problem, so they just say no when really they have a problem. Okay? <laughs> Now, do you want to know the truth? <laughs> okay. So these are the arguments that people made, okay, saying that no, those results can't be right. Well, actually, it looks like they might be right. So it, it, it seems that regardless of how we try and look at anxiety and depression, mental health does seem to improve as you get older. Not for everyone, but in general. So people have tried to ask older adults about their anxiety and depression differently and you get the same result. People have tried to do some really complicated statistical analyses where they've tried to include those people who are dead and that doesn't make any difference to the results either. Okay? <laughs> what it actually seems is that as we get older people actually develop better coping skills, more wisdom and their life experience actually starts to play a role in reducing anxiety and depression in older adults. But <laughs> while anxiety and depression at clinical levels, and what I mean by that is at a, a, a severity that means that they meet diagnostic criteria okay, for a psychiatric disorder decreases, we know that there's no change in the number of older adults who experience some anxiety and some depression to a subclinical degree. So what I mean by that is it's just as common for an older person as a younger person to have mild symptoms of anxiety and mild symptoms of depression. 
the problem, though, is that the research tells us that it doesn't actually matter whether you have anxiety or depression at a clinical degree or if you just have a few of those symptoms, we know that the consequences of not treating those symptoms are actually uh, quite disastrous. Not only does it make you unhappy, but also increases the, the risk of disability, mortality, you are more likely to die, increases the use of medication, increases the use of healthcare services, increases the risk of suicide and increases your risk for dementia. So whether or not people start to improve in the well-being as they get older, for those who are still experiencing any symptoms, we still need to do something about it. While suicide rates are not directly related to symptoms of depression in that people can, and can, can commit suicide for reasons other than depression, a lot of people with depression would, are likely to consider suicide. These are the rates of suicide from the Australian Bureau of Statistics in 2010. And what we have in the blue are the males, and in the red we have the females. Across the lifespan you can see that the poor men are much more likely to, to complete suicide than the women. But we've now got those that age span again, so we're looking at 15 on the left hand side up to over the age of 85 on the right. And there's some alarming things we can see there. So we probably you're aware of the fact that in the middle ages there is a peak for suicide rates in men. And then it drops back down again. We've got this nice happy time in lives. It looks like it's about oh, 65 actually. <laughs> We have the lowest rates of suicide, but then what actually happens is we start to see the suicide rates decrease. So at least that tells us that whether it's depression or something else driving that, a lot of older men are unhappy or certainly not satisfied with their life, maybe it's their health or for whatever reason, and we're seeing more of those suicide rates again. In fact, at, you know, pretty high rates there. And this is the same right across the world. Okay, so the studies that have looked at suicide rates in 21 countries and it's the older men that always come out with the highest suicide rates. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what depression and anxiety look like in older populations. One of the things that's also quite interesting in this area is it seems that depression looks a little bit different as someone gets older. So some research suggests that older adults are less likely to talk about feeling sad and they're less likely to feel tearful. While in younger samples, these are, the, these are the hallmark symptoms that we, we might see. In older adults instead, they tend to talk more about loss of interest. So no longer interested in, go, in going to the club, no longer interested in catching up with their friends, no longer interested in doing any gardening. Low motivation, so they know there's lots of jobs that need to be done, but they're just not getting around to doing them. Hopelessness, feeling like things aren't going to be able to improve. Excessive fatigue and sleeping a lot, and having difficulty sleeping. Now it's quite interesting that older adults um, experience lower levels of sadness, and it, um, one of the things I want to try and look at is whether this is actually the case or not, so I'll try and replicate this. Um, but there is some um, hypotheses as to why this might be the case, and some suggest that it might be that older adults are less willing to admit feeling low, it might be that older adults are less able to recognise that, they're feeling, that they are depressed. Um, other, other people suggest that maybe it's because depression actually looks different, as I said, it, it's characterised by hopelessness and helplessness rather than sadness. But there is some research that suggests that there are biological and vascular changes that happen in the brain, which actually mean that yes, the way that depression um, presents in older adults is different. Anxiety also changes as people get older. So in younger adults, we might see a whole range of different anxiety problems. But as people get older, only one main problem tends to stand out, and that is the one of excessive worry. So older adults tend to, if they have anxiety, they worry. They worry about their relationships with their children, with their grandchildren, with their spouse, with their friends. They worry about their health. They worry about their finances. They worry about their family. They're also likely to experience restlessness and agitation and to have difficulty sleeping. The other types of anxiety disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder or social phobia, those rates actually decrease as people get older.
And these are just, I guess, some of the common themes of distress that we're seeing in our research trial, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, but of the people who are coming to, for treatment for anxiety and depression, these are some of the things that they're saying are going on in their lives that are actually causing them distress. So some of them say, I've had anxiety all my life, I've always been a worrier. Others might talk about always being pessimistic as a person and having periods of depression on and off throughout their life. Others are experiencing anxiety and depression for the first time. Um, and they would, might report that they're experiencing relationship conflict, either with their partner or with their children or their, their uh, in-laws. Uh, they worry about their family, their children, their grandchildren. I hear a lot about uh, worries about how their children are parenting the grandchildren and not knowing how to step in and what to say and what to, to, to leave alone. Um, burden of caring for elderly parents themselves. Worrying about ageing, illness, dementia, fitness, finances. Difficulties adjusting to retirement. So particularly for men who often have been quite career focused, some of them find it quite difficult making that transition and leaving up work. Bereavement is also a common trigger for people, so uh, losing someone that's close to them. And also isolation and loss of social networks. One thing, and let me tell you one more thing that's really interesting about that national survey, okay, that was, was done on the 8,800 people, is that of those people who actually said, yes, I do have an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder, they asked them then how many of them actually went and sought help. Two groups, age groups of people sought help the least. Can you guess who it was? <laughs> the young people. Only 23% of those, 23 would actually seek help. And the other group were the older adults, 75 to 85 year olds. Only 23% of that population would also seek help for their problems. And yet again, it was, the, it was the men who were less likely to seek help across all the ages. Now in terms of treatment, we actually know, we don't know a lot about how to treat anxiety and depression successfully and that's because there's very little research done, around on, done on this around the world. But the most common treatments that are offered are medications um, and very few studies demonstrate uh, some benefit for psychological treatments. I won't go into this slide because I'm going to tell you a little bit about our research now. One of the things that does happen when, sorry, one of the things that's unique about the research that we do is that we actually look at both tre at treating anxiety and depression simultaneously. So of the little research that is done around the world, they tend to focus on either treating anxiety or depression. But we know that anxiety and depression tend to occur together. So if you've got one, you're likely to have the other. So here's an example from a uh, community sample in the Netherlands. They found that if you had depression, then the chance of having an anxiety disorder was almost 50%. So what we're trying to look at is actually treating anxiety and depression together. And of that research, there's only one randomised controlled trial that exists around the world and that was conducted in 1983. So giving you a little background in terms of why I think anxiety and depression are important areas in older adults, this is where um, some of um, my research is actually now focused. Is we're trying to look at how we can improve the assessment of anxiety and depression. We're looking at the differences in how uh, anxiety and depression are present, so in terms of symptom profiles. We're looking at emotion regulation, which means are, is older, are older adults better able to regulate or control their emotions? We're looking at differences in coping skills and how they cope with stresses in their life. Differences in, oh, also investigating the barriers to treatment seeking. So given we know that older adults are less likely to seek treatment, I'm trying to look at well, what is it that stops them from seeking help? We're also doing some research on how best to treat anxiety and depression and we're looking at how someone's cognitive ability might impact on the success of that treatment. So I'm just going to tell you about a recent trial that we've conducted. It's a randomised control trial. Uh, we looked at group psychological treatment for older adults over the age of 60 who had anxiety and depression symptoms. And we found that compared to doing nothing, Teaching these people skills to manage their anxiety and depression produced benefits for both anxiety and depression symptoms and that these improvements were lasting three months later. 
So this gives us some hope that we can actually do something to try and help people who might be experiencing anxiety and depression. If any of you prefer to see that as a picture, this is just a graph demonstrating changes in depression scores. So in the light blue is the people who participated in the group program and those in the, in the dark blue were the people who were waiting so that we did no treatment for those people. And this is their depression score pre-treatment, so before we did anything. This is 12 weeks later, so those who participated in the group had had 12 sessions of uh, group psychological treatment and those in the waitlist had done nothing, they just waited for 12 weeks. And then three months later, we then find that those who had actually received treatment, their depression scores have continued to decline, okay, so they're feeling better and better. The reason there's no dark blue in that last column is because after 12 weeks of waiting, we let these poor people then have some treatment, okay? <laughs> We do try and do ethical research here. <laughs> the latest research, so based on that particular trial, we've actually, I was actually able to receive some funding to continue to do this research. And so the next step in this research is to now look at comparing two different types of psychological treatment to try and work out what's better. Okay, so we've now got two different treatments head to head. One is focused on skills and, and teaching people in a very prescriptive way how to treat anxiety and depression. And the other focuses on improving discussion, disclosure and in socialisation. And both of these two groups are actually helping people with anxiety and depression and they're tested to see which one is the best. Then we'll really know uh, the best way to move forward from here. So what we're taking is people into the trial who are, who are over the age of 60 and have some anxiety and some depression symptoms. And we're looking at how the group program might improve their symptoms, but also their quality of life, and also whether it makes any changes in their cognitive performance, so their mental abilities as well. And this is actually a, a current trial. It's a three-year trial. It will end in the, the um, end of 2013. And I've actually got some flyers which, about this particular trial, which I've actually, I think, are left out with the uh, tea and coffee, or out the back, up there. There's some pointing going on, but I think on the tables at the back. So if any of you are interested in joining our trial or you think that this trial might be helpful to someone you know, please feel free to take a, a uh, flyer and you can ask us for some, for some more information. Um, if, so yeah, as I said, there's a flyer at the back. If any of you want any more information, there's some contact details for the Emotional Health Clinic and also for the Emotional Health um, Centre as well. So anyway, so thank you. I hope that's at least provided you some information about anxiety and depression in older adults and I'm very happy to take any questions about my ageing research um, or if you have any questions for, about the centre more generally, as I said, I have some colleagues who would be very happy to answer questions for you.